Cranberry, chapter 1. Angels were falling all over the place. Miles blinked, trying to resolve golden streaks sleeting through his vision into mere retinal flashes, but they stubbornly persisted as tiny, distinct figures, faces dismayed, mouths round. He heard their wavering cries like the whistle of fireworks from far off, the echoes buffeted by hillsides. Ah, terrific! Auditory hallucinations, too! Granted, the vision seemed more dangerous in his current adult state. If he could see things that were not there, it was also quite possible for him to not see things that were there, like stairwells or broken gaps in this corridor floor, or balcony railings, but would he feel those pressing against his chest? Not that he could see anything in this pitch darkness, not even his hands reaching uncertainly before him. His heart was beating too fast, rushing in his ears like mu muffled surf his dry mouth gasping. He had to slow down. He scowled at the tumbling angels, peeved. If they were going to glow like that, they might at least illuminate his surroundings for him, like little celestial grab lights. But no, nothing so helpful. He stumbled and his hand banged against something hollow sounding. Had that bit of wall shifted? He snatched his arms in, wrapping them around himself, trembling. And just cold, yeah, that's it which had to be from the power of suggestion since he was sweating. Hesitantly, he stretched out again and felt along the corridor wall. He began to move forward more slowly, fingers lightly passing over the faint lines and ripples of drawer edges and handle locks, rank after rank of them, stacked high beyond his reach. Behind each drawer face, a frozen corpse, stiff, silent, waiting in mad hope. A hundred corpses to every thirty steps or so thousands more around each corner, hundreds of thousands in this lost labyrinth. No, millions. That part, unfortunately, was not a hallucination. The cryocombs, they called this place, rumored to wind for kilometers beneath the city. The tidy blocks of new mausoleums on the city's western fringe, zoned as the cryopolis, did not account for all the older facilities scattered around and underneath the town going back as much as 150 or 200 years, some still operational, some cleared and abandoned. Some abandoned without being cleared. Miles' ears strained, trying to detect a reassuring hum of refrigeration machinery beyond the blood surf and the angels' cries. Now there was a nightmare for him. All those banks of drawers bumping under his fingertips, concealing not frozen hope, but warm, rotting death. It would be stupid to run, even by a statistically valid sampling and multiplication method. <laughs> Miles had done such a back of the napkin rough calculation when he first arrived here on Kibu Danai, what, just five days ago? Seems longer. If the cryocorpses were stacked up along the corridors at a density, on average, of 100 per 10 meters, that made for 10,000 along each kilometer of corridor. 100 kilometers of corridors for every million frozen dead. Therefore, something between 150 and 200 kilometers of cryo corridors tucked around this town somewhere. I am so lost. His hands were scraped and throbbing. His trousers was torn and damp with blood. There had been crawl spaces and ducts, hadn't there? Yes, but some seemed like kilometers of them, too. And more ordinary utility tunnels lit by sealing tubes and not blind with centuries of mortality. His weary legs stumbled and he froze. Stopped. Once more to be sure of his balance. He wished fiercely for his cane, gone astray in the scuffle earlier. How many hours ago now? He could be using it like a blind man on old earth or Barriere's own time of isolation, tapping in front of his feet for those so vividly imagined gaps in the floor. His would-be kidnappers hadn't roughed him up too badly in the botched snatch, relying instead on a hypospray of sedative to keep their captive under control. Too bad it had been in the same class of sedatives, to which Miles was violently allergic, <laughs> or even, judging by his present symptoms, the identical drug. Expecting a drowsy deadweight, they'd instead found themselves struggling with a maniacal little screaming man. This <laughs> suggested his snatchers hadn't known everything about him, a somewhat reassuring thought, or even anything about him. You bastards are on the top of Imperial Lord Auditor Miles Forkosigan's very own ship list now, you bet. <laughs> Under what name? Only five days on this benighted world and already total strangers are trying to kill me. 
Sadly, it wasn't even a record. <laughs> he wished he knew who they'd been. He wished he were back home in the Barrier and Empire, where the dread title of Imperial Auditor actually meant something to people. I wish those wretched angels would stop shrieking at me. Flights of angels, he muttered in experimental incantation, sing me to my rest. The angels declined to form up into a ball like a will-o'-the-wisp and lead him onward out of this place. So much for his dim hope that his subconscious had been keeping track of his direction while the rest of his mind was out and would now produce some neat inspiration in dramatic form. Onward, one foot in front of the other, wasn't that the grown-up way of solving problems? Surely he ought to be a grown-up at his age. He wondered if he was going in circles. His trailing hand wavered through black air across a narrow He'd been suckered into exploring down too many of those already, which is part of how he got so hideously turned around, still possessed. Yes, a door. If only it wasn't another utility closet. If only it was unlocked for a change. Unlocked, yes. Miles hissed through his teeth and pulled. Hinges creaked with corrosion. It seemed to weigh a ton, but the bloody thing moved. He stuck an experimental foot through the gap and felt around. A floor, not a drop, if his senses were blind again. He had nothing with which to prop open the door. He hoped he might find it again if this proved another dead end. Carefully, he knelt on all fours and eased through, feeling in front of him. Not another closet. Stairs, emergency stairs. He seemed to be on a landing in front of the door. To his right, steps went up, cool and gritty under his sore hand. To his left, down. Which way? He had to run out of up sooner, surely. It was probably a delusion, if a powerful one, that he might go down forever. This maze could not descend to the planet's magma, after all. The heat was all the dead. <laughs> there was a railing, not too wobbly, but he started up on all fours anyway, patting each riser to be sure the step was all there before trusting his weight to it. A reversal of direction, more painful climbing. Another turning and another landing, he tried its door, which was also unlocked, but did not enter it. Not unless or until he ran out of stairs would he let himself be forced back in there with those endless ranks of corpses. He tried to keep count of the flights, but lost track after a few turns. He heard himself whimpering under his breath in time with the angel ululations, and forced himself to silence. Oh God, was that a faint gray glow overhead? Real light or just another mirage? He knew it for real when he saw the pale glimmer of his hands, the white ghosts of his shirt sleeves. He hadn't become disembodied in the dark after all. Huh. On the next landing, he found a door with a real window, a dirty square pane as wide as his two stretched hands. He craned his neck and peered out, blinking against the grayness that seemed bright as fire, making his dark staring eyes water. Oh, God's a little vicious, let it not be locked. He shrugged and gasped relief as the door moved. It didn't creak as loudly as the one below. Could be a roof, be careful. He crawled again out into the free air at last. Not a roof, a broad alley at ground level. One hand upon the rough stucco wall behind him, Miles clambered to his feet and squinted up at the slate-gray clouds, a spitting mist and lowering dusk, all luminous beyond joy. The structure from which he just emerged rose only one more story, but opposite another building rose higher. It seemed to have no doors on this side, nor lower windows, but above, dark panes gleamed silver in the diffuse light. None were broken, yet the windows had an empty, haunted look, like the eyes of an abandoned woman. It seemed a vaguely industrial block, no shops or houses inside.